Now from the Sirius XM studios in Washington, D.C., it's a special Sirius XM town hall with Pete Buttigieg, the 19th Secretary of Transportation. Here's your host, Julie Mason. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to have Secretary Pete Buttigieg back in our studios. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be back. And we've got a terrific studio audience, and we have plenty of time for all your questions. So if I don't have them written down, have them in your head, because we're going to get we're we're going to get to you. Um, let's start with your travels. You've been traveling a lot lately. You were in yeah. Birmingham the other yes. day, talking about reconnecting communities. How did they get disconnected? So uh, many communities, including in Birmingham, experienced disconnection, unfortunately, because of federal transportation funding. What happened, especially in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, was a pattern where often as the interstate highway system was being built or a railway or another piece of infrastructure was set up in a way that went straight through the heart of a community, typically a low-income community, almost always communities of color. And even though that was half a century ago in some cases, we're still living with the consequences of that. Good news is we can do something about it. And that's what last week's travels were about. We've just put out $3.3 billion to do projects around the country that reconnect places that had been divided. In the case of Birmingham, Birmingham, it's their fourth avenue, which is a very historic uh, street. It's an area that's really at the heart of a thriving black or a once thriving black business district. But it never was really the same after the interstates were built. We're helping Birmingham with a vision that the mayor has been leading there to have a, a more vibrant street pattern and using federal funds to help them do it. I was in Dallas soon after that, uh, parts of major interstate highways that we are now going to help uh, put basically a roof over or a deck that creates new land. It stitches together the parts of the community that are otherwise very much separated by that highway going in between them. And it creates something that's very, very hard to ever create, which is new land in the heart of a city, which they're going to use for a park. So would, it would be like an overpass, kind of like High Line in New York, and then basically grass yeah. on it or yeah. a park or something that would connect the two communities? Yeah, Atlanta's doing something similar. They call it the stitch because this this style of, uh, of construction is sometimes called a cap and stitch. In other words, you build a cap over the old highway and then you stitch neighborhoods back together. And this is not just a story in, in, in the South. Uh, we're uh, working on a project in Buffalo, New York, uh, where their uh, east side is, is cut off. Similar dynamic, similar solution. Uh, really excited about the projects we're doing around the country on this. And that's what last week's travels were about. And that's very interesting because some of those like off ramps and stuff really did just decimate yeah. historic black neighborhoods. Yeah. I saw a lot of that in Texas. Do we have the economic capacity in this country to bring those areas back with shopping, with housing, with people? We can. And, and what I love about this is everybody is better off. Uh, there were communities that were made dramatically worse off by some of those uh, those interventions, but nobody's worse off when we put it right. Uh, traffic will still flow. Cars can still move, but the highways will no longer be as divisive as they once were. Uh, it's true that the funding is limited. Even with $3 billion, there are so many more places we wanted to work on than we could. But we were never able to do this work at all until President Biden's infrastructure plan passed with dedicated funding for this. And some of the money is also coming out of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, and while we're at it, of course, creating a lot of good paying jobs working on the construction that in turn is going to make these neighborhoods and communities better off. Very interesting. All right. Can we talk about Key Bridge? Yeah. So you got the call like 1.30 in the morning. What was that like? And you had to go out there. So, yeah, the, the incident happened at 1.30 uh, later on that morning. Uh, I, I got the call. The, the last thing I usually do before I go to bed is take my work phone off silent. In fact, I remember I went to bed and I thought, did I, is my phone still on vibrate? I got up, walked across the room. I put it on. I don't know about you I put it on my dresser so that I'm not tempted to look at my phone as I'm going to bed or in the middle of the night. <clears throat> went over, turned the ringer back on, went to bed. And a few hours later was woken up to the news and then saw the shocking video of this real piece of the Baltimore skyline, mm -hmm. the, this bridge that stood there since the 1970s, being struck by a, a large container vessel and collapsing into the river in a matter of seconds. And... Of course, immediately knew that, that, that we had to get to work. Did you have like a pit in your stomach? Like, oh my God, like, I hope there weren't a lot of cars on the bridge. Especially because one of the last things you see in that footage is a vehicle going across the bridge, which actually, as we understand it, that particular vehicle was, was okay. Um, got off just in time, but six workers were not. Uh, these are workers who were out there on a cold night filling potholes, fixing a road while most of us were sleeping and lost their lives. The seventh was badly injured and eighth was rescued uh, was uh, w without major injuries. So 
uh, anytime you hear of a transportation tragedy like that, you you think first of all about the the, the human cost. And frankly, uh, I expected there would there would be much more loss of life just having seen the proportions of the bridge. It turns out there's several reasons why it wasn't even worse. Uh, one is quick thinking by people uh, on board the ship and emergency responders who acted to to stop. Uh, traffic from going on the bridge. Also, traffic was already stopped in one direction because of the work that those maintenance workers were doing. Um, And the simple fact that it happened in the middle of the night compared to uh, a collapse that took place in Minnesota at rush hour in 2007, which had uh, dozens and dozens of casualties. Uh, Really, those things kept it from being even even more dramatic human tragedy. Uh, But of course, we also knew that right away we had to get work on helping Baltimore and Maryland figure out what to do about the port, which is almost completely closed now because that bridge fell into the main channel that ships need to uh, access in order to use the port. And the question of what's it going to take to get that bridge back up. Mm -hmm. Earlier today, I was on Capitol Hill with a bipartisan delegation, every member of the Senate and the the House from, from Maryland, uh, as well as administration colleagues and uh, and Governor Wes Moore, who's been a, a really impressive leader as he has rallied his state and his administration to get to work. Talking about what comes next, it's going to be a very long process getting back to normal, but it has brought out the best in people. It's really brought a lot of awareness to all the different parts of the economy that rely on ports, because we see mm-hmm. the ships, obviously, and we know about the longshoremen. You recently had a call uh, to deal with the truckers yeah. who are who are out of work because of this. So there's just all these sort of concentric circles of problems relating to that bridge. Yeah, anytime you, you touch our supply chains, you learn how deeply interconnected they are. Mm-hmm. So uh, on about day two, I did a convening where we brought together the the, the port uh, shippers, cargo owners, but also the railroad uh, companies and the truckers to talk about what came next. Uh, trucks, of course, relied on that bridge, uh, but also the trucking traffic uh, that has now had to adapt to moving goods that would have come into Baltimore now instead come into places like Rhode Island or uh, Georgia, but still have to get to Baltimore in Mm -hmm. order for those goods to be processed. Obviously, really changes a lot of plans and, and, and calls for a lot of creativity and coordination. The good news is, because of what we went through in 2021, when we had all of those ships backed up on the West Coast because of COVID and what was going on with the factory shutdowns in China, we built a number of, uh, uh, of tools and spaces for collaboration as a response to that, that we knew would come in handy again. We didn't know how. It turned out this is one of the answers to how. Really interesting. Hmm. And it's also been poignant, hasn't it, to hear um, explanations about how this bridge being missing from the skyline is yeah. almost a psychic wound on the people there. They're very aware. It's like a missing tooth and a handsome face. Yeah, the, the governor was talking about it today. The mayor, Brandon Scott, was talking about how his, his whole life he grew up looking at that bridge, seeing that bridge. It is very much part of, of their mental as well as physical geography. But that also means there's going to be a determination to build back a new bridge better than ever, stronger than before. And that will become a new part of Baltimore's story. And you can feel how many people just militantly believe in Baltimore and care about (laughs) that city, which as a former mayor is something that warms my heart because that's what it takes to get through moments like this. There were some bad points, though, conspiracy theories surrounding the accident, racism directed toward the governor and the mayor. I thought the governor had a great line. He said, I don't have time for foolishness. Yeah. That's right. Uh, no, he's, he, he and the mayor have handled that uh, with, with a great deal of class. It is troubling that, that even something as uh, tragic and as in some ways straightforward as a bridge collapsing because it was struck by a container ship could be twisted into somehow being about uh, uh, about politics, about you know women and minorities and some really weird stuff out there uh, that, that shows that, that some people out there have a one-track mind. But I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, most people on both sides of the aisle have responded to this in a way that I think speaks to the awareness that transportation and certainly transportation tragedies are not about Democrat, Republican. They're not about ideology and right and left. They're just about us as human beings working to make sure we have the transportation we need and trying to save lives out there. Why can't we have high speed rail? (laughs) We want high speed rail. You sound like my boss. (laughs) I'm often compared to Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is you get what you pay for. And um, that's part of the answer. Part of the answer is we haven't invested in alternatives to vehicles enough over the last 50, 80 years in this country. But we're changing that. We are investing right now billions of dollars in two major high-speed rail projects. 
Uh, one of them is north south in California. The second is going between Nevada and Southern California. And I'm sorry, isn't there one in Dallas as well, or is that just under consideration? I was just in Dallas, and yes, there's a, this is this one is not as far along, mm -hmm. but there is a vision to link Dallas and Houston together, and uh, we have invested in some of the planning activities that are going to uh, help uh, get that project onto the drawing board and, and, and really bring it closer to um, uh, to being in a position to propose a, a construction project. But my belief is that once an American somewhere on American soil is able to buy a ticket and ride in true high speed rail, there's going to be no going back. A lot of people already have that experience. You go abroad, you go to a place like famously Japan or, or China, but evenly, Europe. even, yeah. yeah, I mean, Spain, Italy, um, Morocco, Turkey, you probably have a better rail experience than, than most Americans do and come back and say, why can't we have nice things? Well, the answer is we, we can if, if, if we fund it. And I believe that funding has a great return on investment, not just because there's the economic benefits of these communities being linked, but also creating a high-speed rail industry right here on American soil, building the, the infrastructure and building the trains, something else that, that the president cares about deeply. So uh, if the Nevada to Southern California project hits their marks, which are very ambitious, they would be in revenue service in time for the LA Olympics. That's their goal. Ooh. That's 2028. That would be the last year of President Biden's second term. And um, I really believe w w whenever and wherever it happens, and, and that looks like the, the, the likeliest uh, first opportunity, Americans want this everywhere. And right. Is that LA to Vegas? It is, it'll get as far as Rancho Cucamonga in this phase. Uh, then there, there are some really interesting visions of linking it into the North-South project and other, uh, other parts of the transportation system. But there, there's no reason why. Since when is America consigned to being inferior in anything? That, that, that's my answer to anybody who says we can't have high-speed rail. Of course we can. <laughs> we, we can if we choose to, right? And we choose to in this administration. This is Sirius XM's POTUS, Channel 124. You're listening to Sirius XM Town Hall with Pete Buttigieg, the 19th Secretary of Transportation. Here's your host, Julie Mason. I'm Julie Mason. You're listening to a special Sirius XM Town Hall with Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. Um, Boeing has mm. turned us all into amateur air marshals. <laughs> we are we are checking the screws on everything. Yeah. Um, what what can you tell us about that? Well, Boeing's under a microscope right now. Mm -hmm. We're putting Boeing under a microscope. The FAA, uh, under our administrator Mike Whitaker, has given them about ninety days to, and we're more than thirty days into that, to demonstrate a plan to transform their quality control and safety assurance processes, because there should never be a situation like what happened on that Alaska Airlines flight, where a plug door blew out mid-flight, depressurized the cabin, and uh, could have had much worse consequences. Now. Part of why we're putting Boeing under such a microscope and taking such extraordinary measures, including restricting them from increasing their production until they prove they can do it safely, is to maintain the extraordinary safety record of the U.S. when it comes to aviation. Uh, flying uh, on an airliner is one of the safest, uh, it is by far the safest mode of transportation in the U.S. And um, it is literally statistically safer than than most everyday activities that we do in the United States. The challenge, of course, is to keep it that way. And I only wish that we could take that same level of cultural intensity that we have as a country about aviation safety <laughs> and, and apply it to other things, in, including, by the way, roadway safety, where we lose more about as many people as could fill a 737 every single day. Since the pandemic, the road rage is out of control. I mean, you've seen it. Your, your department, I believe, tracks um, pedestrian fatalities and yes. also car accidents. What have you seen? We are finally beginning to reverse that rise in roadway deaths, but that's off of a very high number. The number's about 40,000. So to put that in perspective, that's about the same as gun violence in this country, but it gets radically less attention. We're just used to it. We treat it as normal. It's not normal. And it is preventable. And I know it's preventable because there are many communities that have gotten to zero. Uh, not just abroad, places like Stockholm and Oslo, which routinely have a year where they have single digit or even zero uh, roadway fatalities. But here in the U.S., not our biggest cities, admittedly, but not our smallest ones either. Edina, Minnesota, Evanston, Illinois, Hoboken, Jersey City. These are all communities of tens of thousands of people in the United States that have managed to go at least one year with no fatalities. We need to build on that. And that's what our department's embrace of what we call vision zero, ah. uh, the vision that the only acceptable number of roadway deaths is zero. That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. uh, that means safer vehicles. It means investing in safer roadway designs. It, it's going to take a lot to get there. 
I believe we can. I believe we have to. Because even the 1% reduction that we saw just over the last year in roadway deaths off of 40,000 people, that's 400 lives. Again, that's two or three airliners full of people who will live and not die for every 1% that we can take off roadway fatalities in this country. That's a terrible number. That 40,000, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's way too high. Uh, it's been two plus years since the big infrastructure bill. Can you give us a status update? And sub question, when will Americans like know that they've had infrastructure improvements? When will they know it? Well, it's happening right now. Part of my job is to remind everybody. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, not, not, every, uh, uh, not every construction project that, that's transforming a neighborhood or a city or an airport has President Biden's face on it. Although, <laughs> uh, although we believe that, that, that it's important to, to have uh, signage and other things that let people know that the, the bipartisan infrastructure law is why these projects are happening. We're at 40,000 and counting in terms of projects that have been identified for funding through this infrastructure plan. And some of them are, are comparatively small. Um, some of them are six-figure projects to redo a streetscape to make it a little bit safer. Um, some of them are the biggest public works projects in, in, or among the biggest public works projects in modern U.S. history, like the Hudson River Tunnel. Uh, that mm. uh, it was about $16 billion to, to get that done. It's going to take years. But it's long, long been needed. And it's going to make a huge difference when it does. There is no part of the country that is not getting major improvements right now to roads, railway, bridges, uh, ports, airports, transit, you name it. So we're in the thick of it. And yet, in many ways, this is still the early stages. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it took about a year to get the bill passed, another year or two to get the programs up and running. Now we've identified the projects. We're moving those into a construction phase. The dirt is starting to fly, especially this year. I do think part of why the jobs numbers look so good is the construction component to that is getting uh, getting higher and higher. And we're still, you know, relatively early in the curve of these things getting completed. Uh, it's extraordinary that uh, a, a government program this large has not had allegations that you're directing all the money to the blue states. Mm. I haven't heard that at all, um, that uh, that, that there, there's no graft and corruption yet, you know, that kind of thing. It just seems to be running uh, extraordinarily smoothly, which makes me a little suspicious. Yeah, look, I, I'm pretty proud of it. I mean, the president was very clear as soon as this passed. He said to all of all of the departments, all of the cabinet, I want you to make sure that, that, that you work with your inspectors general, that, that this is airtight, that it is. Uh, uh, that it is well looked after because these are federal taxpayer dollars. Uh, when you have $1.2 trillion moving through the economy, about half of that is in the transportation side, tens of thousands of projects. We know there will be problems and we will spot them and we will address them anytime we find out about them. Uh, but we're proud of the record that we're building uh, through a lot of very rigorous uh, and intense processes, which, which butt up against our other goal, which is to move quickly. So we've got to do it right, and we got to do it quickly. And that's what our team is working so hard on every day. Of course, you do have Republicans out there who voted against it now taking credit for it's it. funny in how community. that happens, isn't it? <laughs> I, gotta, I think it's a much better sign if somebody who is against it tries to take credit for it than if somebody who is for it tries to run away from it. So to me, that's a sign that oh, we're on oh, the right yeah, track, right? Okay. That's how you know it's a good policy. <laughs> but it is entertaining to see people who voted no try, try to still take credit. But again, to me, that's proof that these are good projects and th these are good policies. So because of this huge amount of spending, what's America going to look like in five years? I mean, in 10 years, it'll need updates, right? But in five years, it'll be safer, safer, uh, greener, um, more economically fair. And what I mean by that is places that were left out in the past will have better transit connections, better roads, better streets. Um, there will always be more to do. I mean, even this five-year bill, there will be a lot of unfinished business, but this is the most we've been able to do since before I was born. And what that means is we've changed the trajectory, the backlog of roads and bridges, the average condition of our airports will go from getting worse each year to getting better each year. We have changed that trajectory already, and we're working to pick up the pace on that change. Sirius XM Channel 124. You're listening to POTUS. You're listening to Sirius XM Town Hall with Pete Buttigieg, the 19th Secretary of Transportation. Here's your host, Julie Mason. I'm Julie Mason. You're listening to a special Sirius XM Town Hall with Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg. We've got a terrific in-studio audience of students, and we want to get their questions in. It is your time to shine. Uh, let's hear from Natalia Wilson. Good afternoon, Secretary. Thank you for being here. My name is Natalia Wilson. I'm a graduating senior honors political science major, Lou communications minor at Howard University. And my question is, as a secretary of transportation, how have you worked to address and repair the impact of systemic racism on US transportation systems and infrastructure? 
Great question. So a lot of it relates to some of the projects I mentioned earlier. We, we know it's not a coincidence that so many of these roadways and other pieces of infrastructure went through black and brown neighborhoods. Think about the fact that we even have the expression in American English, wrong side of the tracks, right? That tells you right there that there has long been a pattern of our infrastructure, which the whole point of it is to connect, and yet it has often served as a social, economic, or racial divide. We think we need to take that head on. I know it's, uh, frankly, I've been surprised by how controversial it was to mention what I took to be widely understood realities, uh, which I didn't go out and discover on my own. I mean, this is thoroughly documented. Um, but part of the reaction was people saying, well, you know, no, no, nobody in charge today is responsible for this. Well, what I know is everybody in charge today is responsible for what we do now. Uh, maybe I wasn't there when Robert Moses built the, 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 some of the roads and, and overpasses in a way that a, that a bus couldn't get to the beach uh, and, and made it harder for, for uh, the, the people who relied on transit to participate in certain parts of the life of that city. But I know now we're responsible for how we use federal dollars to, to help connect places. And we're paying attention to that. Some of it's also just who gets served. I had the privilege of, of uh, signing the full funding grant agreement to bring the Second Avenue subway uh, all the way up to 125th Street in Harlem. That was promised to that neighborhood 70 years ago. The tunnel was built decades ago, and they still didn't finish it. And now we're finally going to be able to get it done. The other thing that really matters is the jobs that come with this work. Actually, just literally today, we celebrated the finalization of a policy change that we've been working on for years, which is to make sure that businesses that have been historically excluded or discriminated against have a, a better shot at getting a chance to do the contracting work that creates wealth and opportunity, uh, including for workers who have been left out in the past. We're doing local hire preference. The Frederick Douglass Bridge right here in, in Washington is a great example of a local hire effort where more of the people who got to work on that bridge that connects the sixth and eighth wards uh, actually were from the neighborhoods uh, that surrounded the bridge. That didn't always used to happen. It still doesn't always happen. So we've been working with the building and construction trades uh, to make sure more people get a chance of participating in these good-paying jobs that were not included in the past. There's a long way to go, but we're being intentional about it because I know that if you have, if you have half a trillion dollars in transportation infrastructure spending and you're intentional about making sure that it is fair, those proportions are enough to actually materially change wealth gaps in this country. I think intentional, intentionality about that is part of why wealth gaps have actually begun to close a little bit in the last few years, according to the most recent Fed data. But as, as everyone knows, we've got a long way to go. And we're going to continue being very intentional about that for the future. Thank you. Ronnie Perillo, a junior at Syracuse. Secretary, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. So I am a broadcast journalism and political science student at Syracuse. I'm wondering about EVs. Mm. The Biden administration, they've made a huge effort to increase public support for electric vehicles. It has been slow to stick. We've seen Ford Motors, Mercedes-Benz, General Motors start to throttle back on vehicles that they have really planned to push out quickly. So what is your message? Why does the Biden administration continue to push this when the charging isn't ready and when some EV chargers actually do run off fossil fuels themselves? And what are you doing to continue to build those chargers? Yeah, very important and interesting set of questions uh, in there. First of all, to be clear, demand for EVs is higher every year than it was the year before. We believe that EVs are coming to the automotive industry with or without us. Now, that might raise the question, okay, if that's going to happen, why, why bother with all these policies? And our answer is that certain things are not guaranteed. Will the adoption of EVs be fast enough to help us fight climate change? Will it be... Uh, accessible and affordable to all Americans, or does it stay a luxury item? And as something especially important to President Biden and very important to me because I'm a child of the industrial Midwest. My, my hometown of South Bend was an auto town that barely survived the loss of the Studebaker car company, is the question of will these EVs be made in America? Will this EV revolution be a made in America EV revolution? That's what our policies are about. What we've been able to achieve so far is a reduction in the cost of EVs, and uh, we've begun the work on, on getting chargers out to a level that the president expects should be 500,000 across the country. Um, as you mentioned, we're nowhere near there. But that's exactly why we got to push so hard. <clears throat> Look, if you live in a single family home and you got a garage, charging is easy. You just plug it in the wall, no problem. But if you're in a multifamily building here in DC, uh, it's not so simple. 
or if you have a, a driving pattern where you regularly go more than 100 miles, uh, which in a lot of rural areas, pe some people do, then you need chargers along the way. That's why we're directly funding them. It's new. Uh, we've never had a federal program for something like this. And it's taking the states a while to get it uh, into gear, but that's what we're doing. Now, one other, not to get too nerdy, but but I, I, I'm safe getting nerdy with this group, right? <laughs> Very important to understand, you mentioned the fossil fuel point. So first of all, uh, a gas car is 100% fossil fuel. Our energy grid as a whole is 25% renewable, and that percentage is growing. So even if it's just like for like, you're coming out ahead. But also importantly, it turns out as a matter of just physics, that it's much more efficient, even if you were only using fossil fuels, which we don't, but even if that's all you had, it would still be more efficient to burn those, those fossil fuels at a utility plant, turn it into electricity, and then wire that electricity out to the cars, than it is to burn the fossil fuels individually in hundreds of millions of little engines at a time. Uh, and have hundreds of millions of individual combustion chambers going at the same time. The most efficient combustion engines are maybe 40% efficient in terms of the energy that goes into them versus the energy that comes out of them. Uh, it is better than double that in an electric car. So uh, even if we were trapped in a fossil fuel only electric generation scenario, which thankfully we're not, and my colleague Jennifer Granholm and the Department of Energy are working to up our renewables, even if we were though, there would still be a pollution and climate benefit. Uh, not to mention just what's in our air. I mean, uh, the, the, the rates of asthma and, and other uh, health issues that are associated with all that comes out of those tailpipes, right, is something that, that can be mitigated by, by having those clean EVs. So, look, this is a huge and complex transition. And in many ways, we're still at the infancy of it. This is like this is like the the EV equivalent of the Model T years, right? <laughs> if you start the clock at kind of the invention of uh, uh, modern EVs as we know them, uh, so we know it's it's going to be complicated. There are going to be fits and starts. There are going to be uh, uh, there are going to be twists and turns. I, even you know the chemistry of batteries is still evolving. But I strongly believe we're on the right track, and we need to. I was going to say step on the gas, but we need to keep our foot <laughs> on the accelerator when it comes to getting this work done. Thanks. All right, uh, Gabriella Leva from Howard. Good afternoon, Secretary. My name is Gabriela Leva. I am a graduating senior at Howard University. Um, my question for you was in regards to the recent tragedy in Baltimore. Mm. Do you believe that the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge is going to lead to a change in the way that transportation and, ch ch I apologize, uh, trade-related crises are anticipated and responded to through federal legislation? Great question. Uh, I think it's too soon to fully know what the implications will be because the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, is still doing their investigation. So we don't know everything they're going to find. But at a common sense level, there are two things we really need to understand better, right? Uh, the, the bridge side of things and the ship side of things. In other words, how do we make sure that ships don't go off course and hit things? And how do we make sure bridges are stronger when they experience an impact? Those, those are the two areas that I think it's safe to say will we'll be commanding most of the attention going forward. Now, it is still unclear whether any bridge design, even the most modern, could have sustained a direct impact from a vessel that size. When you're actually on the site, I was back there with the president on Friday. One of the things that does not come across in most of the TV imagery is how big the ship is relative to the bridge. It's almost the same length as the span of the bridge itself that came down. I've heard it compared um, to uh, like the Eiffel Tower maybe or, or a very yeah. straw, tall structure. Yeah, it's like, like the Chrysler building. Right, the Chrysler um, building, sure. Uh, like in incomprehensibly fact, large. Even more than that, it, it, it's, it's not so much the size of a building, it's the size of a city block or several city blocks. Right. The sheer mass of it is like 248 million pounds. Um, so that level of force uh, is, is, is just extraordinary. Again, I don't want to get ahead of the investigators and what they'll find. What I will say is the last time there was something like this, which was 1980, the Sunshine Skyway Bridge in Tampa, struck by a ship, one span of the bridge fell. That led to changes in how bridges are designed. And you'll hear more about uh, what are called dolphins, fenders, and islands, basically around the piers that hold bridges up that were not part of the standards before what happened in Tampa. So just as bridge building today is different than it was in 1980, I think it'll be different in 2030 than it is today. And I do think that will be informed by some of the lessons of what happened in Baltimore. It's just too soon to have all of those lessons in hand. Thank you. Uh, let's hear from Max Edelstein from Johns Hopkins. Hi, Max. Good afternoon. Um, I was originally going to ask a question about high-speed rail, but it was stolen ask. away. So <laughs> I'll ask a more specific question. And that is, as you mentioned, we're kind of at the infancy of the high-speed rail um, 
you know, adoption by the United States. And I'm wondering if you could identify certain policies that perhaps local or state governments or even the federal government could implement that would accelerate um, the development of high-speed rail. I'm from San Francisco myself, so I certainly see the benefits in having, you know, a, a conduit between uh, North and South California. But um, if you could identify, you know, specifically, you know, where people who are really excited about this idea could push um, for things that would accelerate this adoption. Yeah, for sure. One thing I would mention, and, and this is true of all of our projects in this infrastructure plan, is what, what all of them have in common, all 40,000 of them, from the Hudson River Tunnel to a six-figure grant to fix a street corner somewhere, is that none of them were invented at the U.S. Department of Transportation. Not one of them was cooked up at our headquarters in Navy Yard. All of them are projects that were put forward by states or cities or airports or counties or combinations of states and cities and counties. And so the, re the reason I mention it here is if you're passionate about some transportation improvement, like the advent of high-speed rail, even something as big as high-speed rail, one area to really focus on is the level of commitment and interest by the state. Uh, if California were not committed to high-speed rail, we wouldn't have that project seeking to link the Bay Area to, to Southern California if Nevada hadn't stepped up. Interestingly, in the case of Nevada, working uh, with a private partner called Brightline, which is mobilizing a lot of private capital to do this. They're already doing this, uh, not high-speed, but in Florida, uh, with very, uh, a very successful line there, also called Brightline. If, if it weren't for that, we wouldn't have projects to say yes to. At our level, what we got to do is make sure that high speed is part of the bigger funding package and, and that we're not just keeping up with maintenance on what we already have, which is a big part of what we got to do. It means making sure that, that policies recognize the importance of things like climate because the case for high speed rail becomes more obvious when you do the math on the uh, savings in terms of emissions and pollution from having excellent high-speed rail options versus every one of those people on that train having to be individually in a car on the freeway somewhere, right? And I do think it means building up a domestic business. There, there are some first-mover disadvantages uh, that the pioneers of, of U.S. high-speed rail are, are paying right now uh, because this we just haven't done it this way in the U.S. It means it costs more to figure something out the first few times. But it means we need to reinforce those early investments, that research and that development of an industry, because that means each time, every time we do it after that, it should get a little easier, a little cheaper, uh, and we'll learn lessons from, from before. That's what happens in a place like Japan. I was there last year, they were hosting the G7, and I had a meeting of uh, all of the transportation ministers of the G7. <clears throat> we took their famous Shinkansen bullet train to get to the venue of the summit. Uh, they were very apologetic because it was like 45 seconds late, uh, which, which is very rare there. Um, uh, also very rightly proud of this unbelievable safety record they have. But they've been doing this since the 60s. Uh, so, you know, we need to build that. We, yes, we need to do individual projects and, 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 and policies, but we really need to build a culture where this is the norm. So that, again, people, whatever state you're in, red, blue, purple, say, yeah, why can't, why can't we have this? Uh, let's hear from Madeline Ferguson who's an intern at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Hi, Madeline. Hi, Hi yes. Hi. Thank you, Secretary, for being here. Um, so driving large tractor trailers or delivery trucks is one of the largest occupations in the United States with over 3.5 million full-time employees. What is the Department of Transportation's current stance on driverless trucks? If they are approved one day, are you concerned about the millions of workers who will be replaced? Great question. Um, the short answer is they're not ready yet but there's remarkable technological development taking place. And what's important is not just the economics of it, but safety benefits that could come from, uh, um, from the right use of technology. But what I envision there is probably something a little different than a wholesale conversion to robot trucks kind of arranging themselves on our roads. That, that <laughs> may be someday uh, what could happen, but what I think you're more likely to see is a different interaction between a human aboard a truck and the vehicle itself, where the human maybe some years from now is not playing the exact same role they do today, but they're there on a safety basis. They're there to intervene if something goes wrong. Um, they're there to handle the, the transition when it gets to the warehouse. You, you still need somebody, but you don't worry as much about the, the fatigue on somebody who has to literally be in the driving task the entire time. And if we get that right, there's evidence that could create as many good paying union jobs uh, as it affects. And we've seen cases of that in the past. I'm not saying that's automatic. We need to really be thoughtful about this. But uh, an example, a couple examples I'll give you. Um, one example is the ATM 
there was a, a belief when the ATM came about that it might be the end of most employment in retail banking because you wouldn't need to go see a cashier and have him get the cash out of a drawer. You just go to a machine and do it. Turns out employment actually went up, but the task changed. A, a, a teller at a bank was less likely to just be getting cash out of a drawer and more likely to be helping you with some question or issue or task or doing something a little more complicated. Uh, it was that customer service piece, but that became more, more of, of a growth job. The other example I'll give you actually that's a little closer to transportation is you know the, the, the main union that we work with often and closely, uh, the main union that, that uh, represents drivers is Teamsters, right? Um, if you look at the logo of the Teamsters, it's a couple of horses on there, because originally that's what it that's what the word Teamster means. It was the person who was responsible for driving the team of horses that 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 pulled the cart. Um, as far as I know, I, I've yet to meet a single Teamster who is literally a Teamster, right? The Teamsters you meet aren't in charge of horses. And the fact that horses went away didn't mean we stopped having and needing good paying union drivers. It meant that their work shifted. And we got to make sure we train people up in the new categories of jobs or the new types of tasks that these jobs will entail, whether it's more sophisticated or, or complex tasks that, that, that these automated technologies will require, uh, or some of the jobs that come with, with, with building and maintaining them. Even the fact that, that to really have the, some of these visions for the future work, you need not just a more intelligent truck, but a more intelligent roadway that talks to the truck wirelessly. And that's going to create a lot of jobs. So, you know, I, I think... It makes all the sense in the world to be concerned about this. We are, and watch it closely. Uh, but I also think there's a lot of opportunity here, including economic opportunity. And in navigating all of this, our bottom line, top priority, is always going to be safety. All right, look out, Mr. Secretary. Here comes Barrett Fife. <laughs> Hi, Secretary Buttigieg. It's lovely to see you again. Um, I'm not sure if you remember me. Um, I'm Barrett Five, as Julie said, and I actually worked on your campaign in 2020. That's why I thought I recognized you. Good to see you. Thanks for your help back then. Of course, yes, in Iowa specifically. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to start by saying that my time on the campaign was the highlight of my professional life, um, and it's been so such an honor uh, to see the work that you've been doing in the Department of Transportation since then. Um, but my question, you know, we've heard a lot about high-speed rail today. <laughs> Yeah. But I'm actually very interested in the rail that we currently have mm. in America. Um, I'd love to hear you speak more about the future of Amtrak. Um, I understand that billions of dollars were allotted to passenger rail through the 2021 infrastructure bill and through President Biden in 2022. Um, and I'd just love to hear more about how these projects are progressing. I'm also curious because I know that a lot of the funding was allotted to repairs. Yeah. It was allotted to um, increasing commute times, which I'm all about. I've seen many a delayed Amtrak mm -hmm. train. Um, but I'm also curious curious if you plan on expanding the current routes, um, just because I know a lot of people struggle with the fact that Amtrak doesn't seem to actually get you to a lot of convenient places. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great, great questions. And uh, a, a few things I, I would note. First of all, w the, the President's Infrastructure Plan represents the most funding for passenger rail since Amtrak was created 50 years ago. So, so we've got more to work with than ever. But there's a balance between these new routes, which are exciting to, to contemplate and which we want to see happen. And then just dealing with the routes we've already got. The maintenance ba backlog, especially in the Northeast Corridor, is frightening. Uh, I mean, the Hudson River Tunnel alone, right? That's just one little piece of it. Geographically speaking, it's not little in terms of the complexity of the project. And it's a must-do. Other things we can do, though, will actually make it possible to increase frequency. Right here closer to D.C., we're working on Long Bridge, for example. When we get that done, there will be a chance to up to double the, the frequency of trains that are there. And that frequency is important because often... Your daily routine may not be compatible with a train that runs once an hour, but if it runs twice an hour, you can start to make it part of your commuting pattern. That gets you more ridership, which gets you more revenue. You have a virtuous cycle where more people find that the train or the transit is a good example, is a good option for them. So, uh, yes, the honest answer is a lot like a huge proportion of our funding in this bill is going to state of good repair. Just fix what we've got. Again, that tunnel, and that was compromised by Hurricane Sandy, and even then it was almost 100 years old. But we do have enough funding to start restoring service on some of the routes where they had it and then lost it. Um, we're involved, for example, in Gulf Coast Rail, which never recovered after Katrina. But there's, there's a very exciting vision to bring that back online. Uh, but also starting to introduce routes that don't yet exist but should. That's in a program we have called Corridor ID. It doesn't make as much of a splash because we're doing about $500,000 at a time. So in the realm of millions and billions, it might not sound like much. But that's because it's, it's, it's for projects that haven't even been begun to be designed yet. But somebody's saying, okay, what would it mean to have a different kind of route between this city and that city? Um, 
And so many people closer to home have those visions. Goes to the earlier question about what's going to take to get more high-speed rail. So uh, dozens of locations around the country got funding through this corridor identification program to help them get the ball rolling. Uh, and we're hopeful that that in turn will develop into specific actionable projects that will mean that an operator like Amtrak can serve more places. One other thing I want to mention, this is important. It's not just about buying more uh, uh, railroads and, and rail cars and routes. Making better use of the system we have matters. And that's especially true because Amtrak mostly, except in the Northeast, operates on tracks that are owned by the freight railroads. Now, part of the deal when Amtrak was created was that the freight railroads were relieved of a lot of their regulatory responsibilities to make sure that passengers were on their rails on one condition, which is that they were in the way of a passenger train. They had to get out of the way and prioritize the passenger train. To put it mildly, they have not always lived up to that obligation. And the Surface Transportation Board, with our help uh, in terms of the data, is beginning to take a more muscular approach to forcing the railroad companies, uh, the freight railroad companies, to live up to their legal requirement to prioritize passenger traffic. Because chances are, if you're on one of these long distance trains, and I've, I've definitely been there, and you're hours late, it's not because Amtrak did anything wrong. It's because there was a freight train in the way. But of course, you don't you just think of it as Amtrak was late, right? Uh, so in addition to the things that, that are a big dollar investment, better regulation and enforcement can also make passenger rail better in America. And that's something we're working on a lot in this administration. The White House. The Congress. The Supreme Court. POTUS opens the door. On Sirius XM Channel 124. You're listening to Sirius XM Town Hall with Pete Buttigieg, the 19th Secretary of Transportation. Here's your host, Julie Mason. You're listening to a special Sirius XM Town Hall. I'm Julie Mason with Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Let's hear from Ainsley Novak from Hamilton College. Hi, Ainsley. Hello, my name is Ainsley Novak. I'm a junior government major at Hamilton College in upstate New York. Uh, I really appreciate you coming here today and answering all our questions, but my question is, how do we incentivize or convince Americans to use and rely on public transportation services as their capacities expand going yes. forward? Um, it's so important because transit is the solution to so many of our problems. Uh, it certainly is beneficial from a climate perspective, just radically fewer uh, emissions, less pollution per ride if you're on public transportation. It's beneficial economically, especially because it can make a whole neighborhood more economically vibrant if you're connected affordably to jobs. It can even be part of the housing affordability crisis that most cities are facing because it means you can connect to more neighborhoods and still be able to get to work. Um, it even benefits the people who don't use it because if you're a driver on the road, you're competing with less traffic and there's less congestion thanks to other, other people who are using transit. So there's a million reasons to do it. But again, you get what you pay for, right? We've got to make sure that we're investing in transit and making it an option of choice. I don't think the European approach is appropriate here, where, where a lot of it is about penalizing the use of cars. Uh, I think a, a less restrictive strategy that is more about creating options gives us the best chance of public acceptance. We have to have a, an attitude that, that transit can and should be a means of choice, that we, you would choose it even if you do have a car, versus something you only resort to if you don't have a car. Uh, and if we do that, then it's more of an equalizing effect. I heard it once said that a, uh, a, a great society is not one where uh, every, it's less about making sure every poor person has a, a car as it is making sure that every uh, rich person has the option to take the subway uh, or chooses to take the subway because it's a good choice. You have that in, I don't know, you have that in Manhattan probably. Uh, there's a lot of other places that could have that, but don't. Um, because they're either not very dense or they just haven't invested much, uh, as much as they could in transit. But the more you build frequency to what I was talking about in Barrett's example too, if the service is more frequent, more reliable, more comfortable, if it both is and seems more safe, then more people choose it, which in turn makes it, uh, it means there's more revenue in the system. It means there's more ridership, which makes it feel safer. Um, and uh, it means you can have a virtuous cycle of more and more people adopting it. And then even city planning and real estate choices begin to revolve around transit, transit-oriented development, instead of only revolving around freeways, right? And then you have a, a, a really healthy relationship between the way that communities develop and the way that transit development develops. I would add something exciting happening in our time that wasn't possible before, which is with smartphone technology. 
there, there can be more to transit than the traditional system of, of, of light rail, heavy rail, and uh, large buses. Vans, uh, micro transit, uh, those can all talk to each other in a new way. And some cities are being very creative about how to connect a single ticket ride where maybe you take a scooter or a bike uh, to uh, another hub and then you catch a van or a bus to get to where you're going. Because places like where I grew up, is really tough to, to have a hub and spoke system with a 40 foot bus that doesn't have a lot of people on it and only runs once an hour, but could be served with the same funding in a way that reach more people if, if we use that technology. So we're, we're very strongly pro transit. We see huge benefits to it, but we need to invest in it. And again, our culture needs to shift so that we understand that transit can be a great way for anybody to get around, uh, not just something that you depend on if you have no choice. Thank you. Uh, Darius Wagner. You got to pick. I'm afraid you got to pick one. You got to pick one. <laughs> Submitted Greg's, three questions. Greg's a little different one. I think. Oh, okay. I just all right. All right. A little, a little curveball. Okay. Um, all right. Secretary Pete, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm a Georgetown first year, originally from New York City, so right. I've been a transit buff since I was walking. Right. <laughs> so thank you and your administration for all the work you have been doing on making transit more affordable and our environment cleaner. Um, I do want to shift the conversation a little. Um, in 2022 and and in 2024. Republicans have targeted the LGBTQ community, especially trans youth and LGBTQ youth, um, for electoral gain and purposes. And you and you and your family have also been the result of that targeting, unfortunately. And so I, I want to know what you say to a lot of the LGBTQ youth who see these actions on TV, who sees some of the rhetoric um, around just them wanting to live their livelihoods and feel disheartened and saddened about the state of our country and fearful that they may have to upend their lives because a state is passing laws that is targeting their fundamental right to live. Um, so what do you say um, to those children out there or even, even to those adults out there yeah. who are fearful about the direction our country is going? Well, thanks for, thanks for asking that. And uh, it's, it's incredibly troubling to see some of what's going on out there. The most important thing I would say to LGBTQ youth is you're not alone. Uh, that you've got a lot of people, including the president of the United States, who have your back. I wish I'd heard something like that when I was growing up in Indiana, wondering if what I was still coming to terms with about myself uh, would mean that I could never have a family or a career in public service or a chance to serve in the military or a lot of other things. Of course, that's the beginning and not the end. The question is, what are we doing about it? And it's really important at a time like this to stand up to people who think there's some political virtue or gain in targeting some of the most vulnerable people in this country and think that they're somehow better off by hurting people who are not hurting anybody else. For as long as people have in any number of ways been different, there have been people telling them you must be the same as everybody else. Often government figures saying, you must be the same. We command you to be the same. And if you're not, too bad. Part of what has given me hope about our country has been watching how things have changed that made it possible for a family like mine that literally could not have, been, could not have legally existed in my hometown in Indiana 10 years ago to see what's become possible. And yet... We see so much backtracking, especially in the assault on trans youth who are just trying to, I mean, think about how hard it is to be in middle school or high school just generally, and then add to that what some of these young people are going through. Why in the world would your policy priority to be, be to make their life any harder than it already is, right? But I firmly believe that most people do not believe in that kind of discrimination. And I believe in making sure that it is clear from, from the highest levels of our government but also from the grassroots of our communities, um, that people who find themselves wondering if they are safe uh, are not alone. And this is a safety issue too, in, in every sense. It's a safety issue in terms of the violence that, that is often directed against LGBTQ communities. It's, it's reflected in the suicide rates of LGBTQ youth. And just think about it. If all you hear from your trusted elected leaders is that you're not supposed to exist. There is a substantial risk that you might believe that, right? That's what's at stake. 
But again, I don't believe that's going to win the day. I'm not going to let it win the day. A lot of people aren't. The president's not. And I think in the end, we will be able to look back on this as a period where maybe the hard way, but America once again did what it always does best, which has become more inclusive than it was a generation ago. We are out of time. Pete Buttigieg, 19th Secretary of Transportation. What a pleasure to have you back in our studios. Thank you so much. Big thanks to our in-studio audience of students and thanks to the SiriusXM team. I'm Julie Mason. This is POTUS, SiriusXM 124. Thanks, guys.